What I've been asked to do is to outline why are we are with the New Zealand Prostate Cancer Registry and I'd like to stand back a little bit first and outline my role in the Ministry of Health's AQIP or Prostate Cancer Task Force. Um, I'm a practicing urologist and uh, the role that I've been given is to chair the committee around the implementation of some of the recommendations, so trying to put forward for patients who come forward for treatment of prostate cancer to implement some of those recommendations. So I'm going to outline some of those facts coming forward. So one of the things I'd like to say, a little bit like John, uh, this is a collective where there's a lot of input into the, uh, into the meeting. We have got a number of partners within the registry. We have, as we've heard, the Ministry of Health who provided us a document with some guidelines as to what they would like to see in the way of outputs. We've got the Urological Society, which is an Australian and New Zealand collective, and on the basis of that, we have an agreement where any of the guidance and recommendations that are put forward are also agreed with at a urological society perspective so that we can have input from both Australian and New Zealand colleagues to make sure that we get things correct. Uh, we have got a liaison with the Prostate Cancer Foundation as we've talked about with Mark on the committee. Uh, we have got integration with the cancer networks that have been set up around New Zealand. There are four cancer networks set up around New Zealand whose role is to implement improvement in the quality of cancer care. And we're looking at trying to make sure that we have all of the committees and personnel involved in improving the quality of care of cancer aligned with what we are trying to do. So it takes a little while to bring those further forward. So the goals overall are to improve the outcomes of men with prostate cancer. Basically, a registry is an attempt to collect a significant amount of data about men coming forward who have treatment of their localised prostate cancer. So this is not at a general practitioner or at a referral level, but it's looked at what happens when you get referred to a hospital setting and go forward for consideration of treatment for your prostate cancer. And we're initially looking at those men who have what we call localised disease or are aiming to have intent to cure. That we've set up a memorandum of understanding with the Australian registry so that we have an equivalent data collection to what is happening in Australia. And it's very useful because we then have a larger volume of information to get comparison of results so that we've got the ability to have local but international benchmarking. So we can say where are we at with regards management and how are we getting on in relation to our Australian colleagues. We have some advantages over the Australians in that over 60% of men with prostate cancer are treated within our public hospital systems and therefore we should have access to better quality higher volumes of data through that system. But there are some difficulties sometimes getting that information from the hospitals, um, and I'll talk through why that is. There are three things that the Ministry asked us to look at. One was timeliness of care. So the time frame from referral from general practitioner to treatment has been allocated in the Faster Cancer Timelines program, and the goal is to have that done within 62 days of referral. But the advantage of a registry is if you take a record of when all referrals are received and when all treatments happen, you can measure if that is happening and you can compare different geographic regions to make sure you have got the equity that John has indicated is so important. The second thing is to look at what treatments are being undertaken. So we can then say within different regions are patients getting similar access to all of the different treatments and I'll talk through that in my next one or two slides. The third and important aspect is to look at the outcomes of treatment and in prostate cancer treatment for localised disease there are really three important outcomes that we try and measure and they're measured via different means but essentially your goal is to cure the cancer and you can measure that by having an absent PSA or a very low PSA post-treatment. 
And the second thing is to have minimal side effects, which is around continence and erection function. So if we look at access to treatment, in Christchurch we've been collecting our data, which is equivalent to the registry for the last three years. And so we've got access to data on timeliness of care, and this is a little bit around access to treatment. In the last two years of treatment in Christchurch, what we've got is a pie graph which says what are patients having in the way of actual treatment. If we look at 100% of the patients who come forward with localised prostate cancer, and there are pretty good international figures for a certain region as to what percentage of patients should have surgery and what percentage should be treated with radiotherapy. And more importantly nowadays, what percentage should have what we call active surveillance or recognised as having very low risk disease and therefore can be under a surveillance policy where around 80% of them long term will not need to undergo active treatment but undergo observation so you do not get disease progression. And so if we look at that, in the Christchurch region, 32% of patients end up having a surgical procedure. There is a combination of those who have radiotherapy and those who are on hormone treatment prior to radiotherapy of around 22%. There is around 30% having active surveillance a number of them are referred into the private sector where a robotic operation is undertaken and a number of them have wait and watch. And wait and watch is different than active surveillance and as Mark alluded to, it's more treatment where a patient has got a less than 10 year life expectancy and you're aiming just to follow them up and see if they need treatment by hormone therapy or more controlling rather than go to an intent to cure treatment under active surveillance, which is followed much more closely with blood tests and biopsies. So from this sort of data, which we've collected locally, the goal is to expand that nationally so we can see our patients getting adequate access to different treatments. That's where a registry comes into being useful. The second thing that we've got, in Christchurch, we are a training centre and we have registrars involved in training and a number of registrars are involved in treatment so it's important for us to make sure the outcomes of patients who have treatment in a training setting is no different than that with a consultant setting and we have all operations that are done in a training setting very closely supervised but we can through the registry divide the operation up into certain parts and look at the outcomes and show that in fact both blood loss, cancer cure and side effects is no different if a registrar is doing components of the operation or a consultant doing it. So it's an important aspect from our perspective to look at quality from that point of view. The next thing we can do is look at things like continence or how many patients are running into difficulty with urinary control afterwards. And this is data on quality of life of urinary continence 12 months down the track on 300 patients and done through a very similar database to the registry, which the goal is to expand nationally. So we can say that around 60 to 65 percent of patients have no urinary continence problems or wear no pads or protection, but around 20 percent will wear one pad and less than 5% would wear two or three. And the different colour bar graphs are between the operations where the join between the urinary tract and where the prostate was removed from was undertaken by a registrar or a consultant. So we can look at comparative data to say there is not much difference. And we can compare this to international data. And the second thing we can do is we can look at the different surgeons undertaking the operation and say are there differences in their outcomes and how do we look at trying to improve the quality of each surgeon. And you can represent it this way where we look at quality of life and these are the three important measures for quality of life from a prostate cancer treatment. The top line is bowel function, the secondary line is urinary tract function and the third line is erection function at time before treatment, three months and six months post treatment and you can see that there is an uh, deterioration and then an improvement in some of those. So it gives us the ability to predict the outcomes and compare things between different people doing the surgery and different geographies. 
The next part is the cancer cure. How do we tell if we've cured the cancer? The difficulty with prostate cancer is you cannot rely on mortality or people dying from it because it happens such a long time down the track. And that's why things like screening studies are difficult to get answers from because it takes a long time for patients to go through the natural history of prostate cancer and possibly die of that and get two different outcomes. So we look at things called BCR, which is a term for biochemical recurrence or a PSA that has recurred following the treatment, and PSM, which stands for positive surgical margins. When you remove the prostate, it's looked at under the microscope by someone like Brett Dallahunt, a qualified urological pathologist, and they can tell us, is there any likelihood of disease at the margins? So we can look at different surgeons and have different rates of total number of cases, how many margins positive, and whether they have PSA recurrence. So the data registry will allow us to have this, I suppose, information available. So where are we at with that? We have, through the registry, a memorandum of understanding with Movember, which will fund the registry nationally, and the Australian group, which are having an equivalent data set, and they're 18 months ahead of us. We have set up a trust to run the registry, and we have a board appointed to run that. We have an ethics application which has been approved, and you need to do an ethics application to do a registry, and we normally need to have one application for the country, and the application is what you call an opt-out application. So all men with prostate cancer will be offered the opportunity to withdraw from the registry if they want to, and they have to actively do that. If they don't want to, if they're not really bothered by it, they'll always be sent the information. And our goal is to have an 80% uptake across the country eventually over a two-year period. The data is being collected in the Canterbury region at the moment, and the goal is to do that for 12 months to look at getting our systems right so we can get as much electronically captured in our current environment. It's a much safer way and better way of doing it, but there are fish hooks with that. In August this year, we are meeting with the Australian group the Irish group and three others internationally to look at standardised outcome reporting measures. So to give reports back to the surgeons in a standard manner across all of those areas so that we can get some international comparison and people can work out how are they getting on with results relative to others. That's the positives. What are the negatives? There are significant privacy and security issues with this because data is being collected on patients in public hospitals, it's being stored in an electronic system which is equivalent to a bank security privacy system and it's being transferred to Australia for comparative results. And despite there being quite high levels of security, there's a number of hoops to go through within both uh, government and DHBs to make them secure that the information is both private and safe. And at the moment, we are still going through those hoops. Second thing is the Ministry of Health are concerned about internationally sending New Zealand data. And the difficulty we have is that we have a very small population of patients, and it's important for us to expand the pool to get a good comparison. But they have concerns about patients' data, that is New Zealand data, being stored and transferred overseas. All of the data that goes overseas is de-identified, so it does not have an individual name or number attached to it that can be identified, but there are still concerns that have to be walked through with regard to that. At the moment, the Movember has a memorandum of understanding. We've undertaken quite a lot of activity around this, but we've not actually been transferred any money from them, so there's a little bit of an issue with that just on timing. Um, Movember are, in fact, the largest worldwide men's health charity. They run a number of these registries internationally. They run a large number of, uh, I suppose, uh, support group programs and they have, a, I think, a multi-million dollar charitable activity. Over $250 million last year was donated by their foundation. So it's a very big charity. And the last, really, is the IT challenge. And one of the difficulties nowadays is we collect a lot of information from lots of different sources and it would be very nice to develop an electronic system that could pull those bits of information seamlessly together in one record and transfer it across. And that sounds quite simple to say, but to be able to get it to be done 
is a little bit more complicated, but on the secondary side, we're working with a lot of IT providers to try and maximise that system that minimises someone having to go and get data and manually enter it into a database. So that's an update of where we are with the database and where we are with the uh, specialist program with regard to the Ministry of Health package. So at this stage, the goal is in the next two years to get national public hospital cover with a database that we can have for comparison. And one of the difficulties with that is it will take a further 12 months for information to be able to come out of that to be able to provide some outcomes to be able to tell us where we're at. So these things do take time, but we're part way down the track. Thank you.